Good afternoon. Uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event on the Federal Reserve and the Everything Bubble. And it is my particular pleasure to welcome our panelists. Uh, I got here a great set of experts to discuss this issue. Can't think of a better panel to have invited. Uh, in the order in which they'll speak, they're Kevin Walsh, who is currently a distinguished fellow in economics at the Hoover Institution. Before that, Kevin was special assistant to the president for economic policy, and he was then a governor at the Federal Reserve Board. Jason Furman is a professor of economics at both Harvard University and the Kennedy School. He was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors during the Obama administration, and he is a prominent participant in today's economic debate. Then we're gonna have Donald Cohn, who is presently a senior fellow at the Economic Studies Group at the Brookings Institution. He was formerly secretary of the Open Market Committee, and for many years, he was vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And then moderating the event will be Alex Pollock, who is a good friend of mine and a former colleague at AI. He's now a senior fellow at the Mises Institute after being principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury. So just by way of introduction to this afternoon's discussion, I might say that last year in response to the COVID induced economic recession, the Federal Reserve together with the world's other major central banks engaged in an extraordinary round of monetary policy easing. Not only did the Fed keep interest rates at their lower zero bound and allow the broad money supply to expand at by fastest rate in the past 50 years, the Fed also bought US Treasury bonds and mortgage backed securities at an unprecedented pace. It's of note that whereas following the 2008 Lehman bankruptcy, it took the Bernanke Fed some six years to increase the size of the Fed's balance sheet by around $4 trillion. In response to the COVID recession, it has taken the Powell Fed less than a year to do the same thing. It also might be noted that the Fed continued to buy $120 billion a month in US treasuries and mortgage-backed securities through most of last year, even at a time when both the equity and the housing markets were on fire. The net result of the Fed's monetary policy log guess is that we now have a situation of both price inflation and asset price and credit market inflation. Even before the Russian induced spike in international oil, food and metal prices, US inflation was running at a 40 year high. At the same time, by the end of last year, equity valuations reached nosebleed levels experienced only once before in the last 100 years, and housing prices, even in inflation-adjusted terms, increased to levels well above those in 2006 before the US housing market bust. The net upshot is that the Fed has got itself into the most unenviable of monetary policy dilemmas. If it fails to raise interest rates aggressively now, it risks allowing both inflation expectations to become entrenched and further froth to be added to the already bubbly asset and credit markets. That in turn would set the US up for an even harder economic landing down the road than if it now acted in a timely manner. On the other hand, if the Fed were to do the right thing and raise interest rates aggressively now, it might succeed in getting the inflation genie back into the bottle but it would do so at the price of bursting today's everything asset price and credit market bubble. All of this raises a number of questions. How did the Fed get us into the situation of uncomfortably high inflation and asset price inflation at the same time? What should the Fed now be doing to reduce inflation without causing a hard economic landing? What are the Fed's policy options and is it too late now to prevent a period of stagflation? Finally, what lessons should we learn from the Fed's policy response to the COVID-induced economic recession? And how are we to wean ourselves from what seem to be recurrent boom-bust economic cycles? 
So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Alex to begin moderating the session. And I very much look forward to hearing what my fellow panelists have to say. Alex, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Desmond. And let me add my welcome to everybody joining us today and to our outstanding panel as we consider what will happen to the asset price inflation in the face of high consumer price inflation, exacerbated by a war, rising interest rates, the end of the great central bank balance sheet expansion or bloating, we might say, and related challenges, so just as Desmond uh, has discussed. I thought I would add my own uh, perspective on the summary of the background, which Desmond also touched on. Two years ago, this very month, in March 2020, we had the COVID financial panic. Uh, we may remember two years uh, already. Dow Jones average fell 37% in one month. Illiquidity, fear, and radical uncertainty reigned. The Fed applied Walter Badgett's lend freely in a panic theory to the max, heroically. The government lockdown uh, actions taken to control the pandemic led to the brief but very sharp and destructive economic contraction of 2020. Surviving the contraction was financed by huge government deficits and monetized government debt, just as in a war. This was followed by recovery and the emergence of an amazing bull market or bubble markets uh, in equities, notably speculative IPOs, houses, cryptocurrencies, collectibles, and most things, uh, accompanied, of course, by very negative real interest rates. Uh, considering that whole pattern, we may reflect that nothing is free. It's the greatest economic principle, I think. Nothing is free. And so the cost of all this is that by one year ago, March 2021, we had the high inflation already apparent. We were discussing that inflation uh, coming and present in Desmond's conferences last year, uh, Larry Summers in February of 2021, on the analogy of war finance and its inflationary results, highlighted the risk of very high inflation coming. He was criticized by some, but of course he was right. Uh, our colleague on the panel, Jason Furman, Furman, wrote a very good article in January of this year uh, on the subject of how almost every economist, unlike Larry Summers, got the inflation forecast wrong. Thanks for that, Jason. I thought that was well done. Uh, but even more right than Larry Summers were Charles Goodhart and Manoj Pradhan, uh, who writing in 2020 predicted on the analogy of the results of war financing, a 5% to 10% inflation for the US in 2021, a great, a great call. And uh, Charles was on a panel with the uh, with us here, one of Desmond's conferences last year uh, to discuss their inflationary prediction. This successful prediction contrasts strikingly, as we know, with the Fed's own wildly wrong inflation forecasts for 2021 and later their embarrassing, quote, transitory rationale. Uh, all that provides one more lesson in how central banks like the Fed can't really know what the results of their own actions will be. And now we have galloping inflation. Now, not just a financial analogy to a war, but a real war on with unavoidable economic and inflationary costs. Interest rates are finally rising. It seems very late to many of us. Will, will we succeed, as Desmond suggested, in getting stagflation uh, out of that? Uh, how high will the interest rates rise when the Fed truly stops being the big bid? I write that with two capital Bs, big bid, in the bond and mortgage markets. What will happen to the house price bubble, among others? Uh, and it's important in this context to note that although rising quickly and now taking this odd, flat, or even inverted shape out on the medium to longer term end, although rising quickly, interest rates are still low, historically speaking. 
and still low relative to inflation. So do our distinguished panelists. What now? What are the issues faced by the Fed? What are its dilemmas? This central bank to the dollar denominated world, not just the United States, a Fed with $9 trillion on its balance sheet. On the latest report, the Fed, which has made itself the biggest savings and loan in the world, as I like to say, it's a $2.7 trillion in mortgages. That's the biggest pile of mortgages anybody has ever owned. Um, and a Fed who's said they're no longer going to suppress long-term bond and mortgage rates uh, with their big bid uh, facing, of course, high inflation, uh, stretched asset prices, as Desmond said, and as always, uh, lots of politics in everything they uh, say uh, or do. But we couldn't have a more knowledgeable panel or one better able to discuss the possibilities, uncertainties, and hard decisions ahead. Uh, the order of their speaking will be first Kevin, uh, then Jason, then Don, and finally Desmond. Uh, each will speak for from 12 to 15 minutes. After that, we'll give the panel a chance to respond to what others have said or, or to further expand their own views. And then we'll move to a general discussion. We will adjourn at 3.30. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the audience, you can send in your questions to John Kearns at AEI by email or Twitter, and that's shown to you in the, in the conference webpage or the event invitation, uh, the exact addresses there. We are delighted that you are all with us, including this distinguished panel, for this extremely timely and important discussion. And Kevin, you have the floor. All right, uh, Alex, thank, thank you uh, to you and Desmond for hosting this. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be joined by Don and by Jason. Um, I first of all want to first give a uh, enormous amount of credit. It is easy when we are at times of uh, peril to put ourselves on panels with only with folks with whom we agree. And AI time and time again has resisted that temptation. Some other peer institutions seem to have former Fed people, current Fed people, and future Fed people all agreeing with each other. And that, 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 that's not for good policy, nor is it on the other side when um, you've got nothing but a room of permahawks. So this is a robust discussion with, with dear friends. Um, I will resist also the, uh, the uh, opportunity to pile on. The Fed finds itself in a terrible position, um, much to their surprise if we were to take their words literally six or 12 months ago. But I have to say we have a duty to speak clearly about um, institutions that we hold dear, where Don and I have spent, he more, even more than me, much of our sort of intellectual lifetimes. Um, and if we think those institutions matter as much as we do, then repairing errors that are made are part and parcel of the job. So my comments should be taken in, in that spirit. As uh, Alex, you and Desmond Bull said, inflation right now is 8% or so, and it's actually trending higher in the United States. Since the Fed announced more or less it's about face, so at the FOMC meeting a couple of weeks ago, financial conditions are easier, they're not tighter. Equity markets are on quite the run since then. It's true that bond yields have moved, but broad financial conditions indices say uh, markets are looser. Uh, I think there's also a lot of inflation already in train. I have a dear friend who's uh, from Latin America, from a country that historically has great inflation. And he reminds me that when everyone's talking about inflation, both at their kitchen table and the boardroom, it's already too late. And it's hard for us to find a place where inflation is in top of mind. This, this latest bout of inflation was insidious before it was invidious. It's broadening, it's deepening, and the Fed's problems getting bigger and bigger as they pre-announce what they're thinking about doing some weeks from now. So that's a bit of a preview to my conclusions. Um, but I think we've got to think hard about this perilous moment and how we got there. I'll make one other introductory comment and then four quick themes. One is in substance, I think how the inflation problem surprised the authorities in the US and around the world is in part a substantive doctrinal failure. Uh, I think that the intellectual errors that have been made going into this are, are partly responsible for the inflation we have. Second process, 
organizations need to build themselves in a way so it's that decision-making allows for a divergence of views, both inside the room and views they're open to. And I worry that institutions that we hold dear have held a anxious conformity uh, about inflation, its causes, and that there was really nothing to worry about until it was everything to worry about. An old parochialism can creep its way into the hallowed holes of great institutions, whether they be universities where Jason's sitting today or institutions like central banks. A third just high level comment is about risk management. You know, policymakers are in the business of making good decisions and sometimes good decisions don't have good outcomes. But the best we can do in an imperfect world with imperfect information are to make good calls. And I don't think it's only with the benefit of hindsight that the bet they made, I think ex ante and ex post was a bad bet. Um, in Jackson Hole in 2020, most concretely, they pained about the disinflation being, I believe, what they called the greatest challenge for this generation of central bankers. Well, because they wanted to get inflation up 30 basis points, they now have inflation that is 600 basis points over target. That was a bad bet ex ante, uh, and I think it's coming home to roost. Now, let me make uh, four sort of broader themes building on those introductory comments. First is, I think the inflation we see is a failure of prevailing economic doctrine. It's also a failure of imagination. You know, Don and I, when we worked together, we probably didn't have a sufficient imagination about what could have happened in the global financial crisis as these shocks found their way through the global financial system. And I would hope that the doctrinal challenges and the lack of imagination would have been cured in the decade between that crisis and this, but it wasn't. And I can't help but think that we need to better avoid scientism generally, applying principles of the physical world to the economic world, where we know, frankly, quite a bit less. And we should have had at this moment going into the crisis and currently more humility about our theories of inflation. I think Jason rightly talks about the four theories of inflation he teaches his students, but I don't think those four theories are being battled around sufficiently among the thousand PhD economists at the Fed and other central banks. They should have used and should use the massive talent and resources they have to develop an integrated, new, reliable, conceptual and empirical theory of inflation because they don't have one. An old boss of Don's and mine used to say, it takes a model to beat a model. And there was a decade to work on a better model of inflation and that hasn't been done. There's also, I think, a tendency to think about inflation in this context and say, well, it's because of COVID and now it's because of the war. Um, those were catalysts. You know, that's the assassination of the Archduke. That was the catalyst for the world war. But my goodness, this inflation was long in the making. As Desmond and Alex both said, it first found its way into asset prices. And people like me were long concerned about misallocations of capital and bubbles. And that happened before we saw this rise in prices. So I do think this thing was long in the making and there were large structural forces over the course of 40 years who kept down inflation and made guys like Don and me frankly look better than perhaps we deserved. Well, all those forces, or at least most of those are reversing. Additionally, I'd say there was complacency that crept in at the world's central banks and among academics that somehow inflation was going to be around 2% because we demanded it, that was our edict. That's what we described as our price stability objective and we were anchoring things there. And I think there was too much complacency about how much responsibility we were for that. Third, I think the models, even the DSG models that we use at the core of policy in some sense demanded a mean reversion that inflation would go back to 2% because it broadly did in the post-war era certainly since we further anchored inflation expectations. And um, that mean reversion, I think, gave the uh, more superficial reads of that model false comfort. Uh, fourth, I think there was a misunderstood, misplaced deity in the form of R star, as if R star were something that were readily observable that we could know where it would be. And R star got a, a religion of its own, which I think was quite undeserved. And if I could sort of take two more shots at what I think is part of the artifice that created this complacency, uh, 
too much emphasis on modes. What was the most likely thing to happen going into this shock and going into cycles? Not enough time and attention on material risks. You know, Don used to say to me frequently back in when we worked together that the job of a central bank is about minimizing deviations in output and employment from the Fed's objectives. And I think that's true. But if I learned anything from the 08 crisis and the institution should have learned anything, it's you want to be messing around with those deviations when they're substantial, when they're large, when you can do something about that and not be fine tuning. And I guess, guess again, I think if, if we're more focused on where the risks of what could go wrong instead of all of this preoccupation with what might go right, I don't think we would have made this, this error. So that's the first theme, and it's uh, one that can be corrected, though probably not quickly enough to deal with the inflation at hand. Second theme, inflation is a choice, and it's a choice for which the Fed is chiefly responsible. Politicians on all sides have others to blame than the world's central banks for inflation, but I have to say in a sign of the times, many central banks seem to believe that inflation is someone else's fault. It's the fiscal authorities, it's not theirs, or it's something for which the central bank is a, just a victim, a victim of COVID, a victim of the war, and I don't like these excuses. Um, the central bank is able to make choices and largely set inflation at levels that they want. I do not know a theory um, that gives central banks credit for the great moderation and yet absolves central banks of the responsibility for the current inflation surge. I look forward to hearing that theory, but I can't quite make it out. In addition, I'd say inflation, in my view, sounding probably too old fashioned, has something to do with money. Money isn't perfect. We don't measure it perfectly. But money is a word that is impolite to say in the halls of most central banks, including the one that I know best. And I think that if we were more open to the idea that money might have something to do with inflation, we'd revisit what Milton taught us all so long ago, where he said that inflation was, of course, always and everywhere a monetary phenomena. We could do better than that proposition, but I think we could also do a lot worse, and we have. And the way I think about Milton's proposition today is it's up to the Fed to choose its inflation rate. The causes of inflation could be varied, could have something to do with fiscal and monetary policy, something to do with supply chains and shocks, but the Fed gets to choose what it will permit to find its way into the generalized price level. And there's a fun old quote from uh, Justice Scalia when he was on the court where he said, we aren't last to decide a case because we're right. We're right because we're last. I think of the Fed just in that same way. The Fed gets to see all these inputs and then decide on its inflation rate. So let me make just in the few minutes I have left two final points. The third, the third theme really is about inflation and the problems it's brought. I think inflation as we see it now will rank among the most significant economic policy errors in the last 40 years. A rule of thumb taught to me probably 25 years ago by my friend and yours, Larry Lindsay, says that inflation doesn't fall in empirically in the post-war era until the Fed's funds rate gets to the inflation rate. Well, if that's true or even broadly true, this problem was solvable, fixable, at far less cost to the economy six months ago, nine months ago, 12 months ago, when AEI hosted us for similar sorts of panels where we opined on this. And as we've let this go on longer and longer, as we see when we see uh, dictators invading other countries uh, abroad, the price for stopping the dictator goes up over time. The price for stopping inflation has gone up over time too. So when confronted with these inconvenient facts, policymakers and people like us in the cheap seats need to, I think, try to resolve to avoid calling out heretics with ad hominem views because they just might be right. Avoid cherry picking the data, avoid deeming it temporary when we couldn't have known that in any real time. We should avoid doubling down on our policy priors when they weren't working. Avoid blaming others for the situation that finds ourselves in and admit error plainly with a bold face and not worry so much about scaring the children and do the right thing because the longer we put it off, the harder it gets.
Which brings me, if I've got two minutes left, uh, Desmond and uh, you, Alex. You do, my you do, you do have good. exactly two minutes left. Okay, good. To, to, to my final point, and this is in response to the, one of the questions Desmond teed up at the beginning. So how do you get out of this mess? So this isn't just a council of despair, but I admit to being somewhat more filled with despair than I would have been three or six months ago if the regime change had happened then. I'd put it this way. The regime change set up by the Powell Fed and Jackson Hole of 2020 was a catalyst, perhaps not the only cause, but a catalyst for the inflation we see. And regime change will be required to get out of this mess with the fewest casualties. And the Fed a couple of years ago, before the war, got, got rid of the idea that there were long and variable lags in the conduct of policy. They said, until we achieve our inflation employment objectives, we really won't be doing anything. There'll be nothing for preemptive action. We won't be uh, guessing where the puck will go. The puck will get there, and then we'll take action. We need to bring back long and variable lags. People on the left and right, I think, should be able to agree to that. After all, most of us agreed to that proposition for about the last 40 years in the conduct of policy. Um, we need to recognize that when central banks in their long history have asked for a little more inflation, they've often gotten a lot more and this time is no different. So what to do with fewer degrees of freedom, I'll just end with a few, a few brief recommendations. Be clear about ditching the old regime and adopting a new regime. Be comfortable acting as asymmetrically on this side of the shock as the Fed rightly did when the shock hit in two years ago in the spring of 2020. And if that means that you have to act out of a scheduled meeting or you wanted to say something or do something that wasn't what you had spoon fed to markets or commentators before, do the right thing, get on with it. Because the longer you go, it becomes expensive. In addition, I would say I'm a big believer, however unpopular, global coordination. Most of the major G7 countries have similar problems, though not identical. And boy, oh boy, if Don and I were there, I can't help but think that we'd be calling our friends at the other G7 and G20 and coming up with a Sunday night statement and admit that we have a global inflation problem. And while we each have different tools and remits to deal with it, the world central banks, maybe with the exception of folks like Japan and China who aren't quite stuck with these problems, that we take resolute action and show that this is a different regime in addition, I would ditch forward guidance. Uh, I would have done that years ago, so I'm using this crisis as an excuse to ditch it. We've been relying on it too much and it's constraining policymakers. I ditch this idea of data dependence. The data is lagging. The data isn't very good. And our dependence shouldn't be on data. It should be about what we think is going to happen and the data for that doesn't quite exist. And finally, if I could be precise, I would further relegate the dot plot. Poor Don knows I wasn't a fan of it a decade ago not a fan of it now. Uh, the Fed doesn't know the future and I think they should stop purporting to suggest they do. So with that all given in the nature of trying to be constructive, uh, Alex, let me place it back to you for the balance of the panel. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Uh, Jason. So I agreed actually with most of what Kevin um, just said, but he said it all more forcefully. Um, than I would have said. I think in some cases that means he said it better than I would have said it. I think in some cases um, there's a risk of missing part of the story and also throwing um, the baby out with the bathwater. And I'm going to emphasize that other side a little bit, um, which will let me pay the ultimate uh, compliment to something Kevin said that I 100% wholeheartedly agree with, um, which is AEI has always been terrific about bringing together um, different voices and different perspectives. I think that last year, the fiscal stimulus was grossly oversized. I think the Federal Reserve then didn't change what it was doing in response to that. And then policymakers in general stuck with a transitory narrative, assuming eight things were gonna go right, um, many of which weren't gonna go right, ignored eight things that might go wrong, and even sort of economically would take some things that might even be expected to raise inflation and describe them as lowering inflation. So I think there's almost no defending um, any of that macroeconomic policy over the last year. Um, but I would also say um, some good um, came out of it. And I'll, I'll share a few slides to put some context on that. 
Um, I don't think it's all disaster. And I think it is somewhat clear now, but not completely clear. Um, so the first bit of good is the recovery in the United States was much faster than the recovery from the financial crisis. It was much faster than the recoveries that you've seen in other G7 economies and throwing in Korea um, for good measure. We're close to where we were expected to be pre-pandemic. Now, I think the ratio of how much GDP you got versus how much inflation you got from the last set of interventions was quite poor. So I'd rather see this line uh, be a tiny bit worse for the United States. And I think inflation would have been a decent amount worse if that were the case. But I think we don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we did have 20 years of inflation being too low prior to this. I do think our star is real, that there's been a structural decline um, in the interest rate. Um, now, our star isn't where uh, the Fed funds rate is right now. I don't think our star is at a two and a half nominal Fed funds rate in a world of three, four or 5% inflation. So we're way below it. Um, but one does want to take that into account. Um, and I do think that um, strict inflation targeting and trying to get back to your target right away wasn't the best framework. The problem here was less the framework of flexible average inflation targeting and more the misimplementation of it. Um, by the summer, it became clear that we were vastly overshooting even the average inflation target. So even under that framework, um, there would have been a justification for moving um, sooner. Um, this is the inflation rate. Um, we all know what it looks like. Um, this is the Fed's forecast um, for inflation. Now, 2022, um, this is a uh, Fed, the FOMC, the median projection in the FOMC, not the Fed staff's forecast, of course. Um, this forecast for 2022, I don't think is crazy. I would take the over, um, not the under. It's a dramatic change from what the Fed was forecasting in December when they were at something like 2.6 or 2.7 for inflation in 2022. Where I think it gets crazy is, not crazy, where I think it gets unlikely, and I'll talk about both sides of it, is what I think of as an immaculate slowdown, that in 2023, you have a low unemployment rate, you have a relatively low real interest rate, and yet somehow inflation, which has run way above trend for two straight years, magically slows from 4.3 um, to 2.6 without any big fiscal changes, without any big monetary changes. I think this, um, to me, feels um, the least likely, um, and 2024 um, similarly. The inflation we've seen to date is largely explicable through supply and demand. I think it's mostly about demand. I think if you were assuming that the supply side of the economy was going to adjust instantly and perfectly, um, in the wake of a pandemic, you were building your macro policy um, in the wrong way. You were building it around um, wishful thinking. I think it's mostly um, about demand. Um, some of those demand factors are even tighter today than they were um, a year ago. These are four different measures of labor market tightness. Um, the one that gets the most attention, of course, is, uh, oh, sorry, let me show where we are now through February, 2022, uh, is the unemployment rate. Um, the unemployment rate right now is one standard deviation below its average from roughly the two decades prior to the pandemic. So that's decently tight, um, but it's not crazy tight. Um, in my work though, I found that the quits rate is a better predictor of inflation than the unemployment rate. The quits rate is three standard deviations below where it was in previous decades. And three standard deviations, for those of you that don't think in these terms, is the type of thing that happens less than one every uh, 100 years. The openings rate is um, six standard deviations um, above. This is one minus the opening rate, so its tightness is down. Um, six standard deviations. That's like the type of thing that happens every 10,000 years. Um, these are exceedingly, exceedingly tight labor markets. So just demand um, will continue to be high. In fact, it'll have more upward pressure on inflation over the next year than um, was the case otherwise. Um, there's a set of excuses that run in the other direction. We're going to see a shift from goods to services. Um, we're going to see the pandemic easing. We're going to see workers returning. Um, I think maybe there's a bit of truth in some of those. 
but I think all of those are overstated. Um, as we shift from goods to services, service inflation will go up and pick up from where goods inflation was. As the pandemic eases, um, that will expand supply, but it will also increase demand. As, same thing as workers um, return, every one of the workers who returns to a job will also be paid money and will go out and spend um, at least some of these money. Um, on balance, some of the happy stories we hear, I think might tend us towards a bit less inflation, not more, um, but a bit. And even the sign isn't obvious. The story of inflation in 2021 was entirely about demand. It was mostly about demand, uh, plus a bit of supply. This year, I think it will be almost entirely about demand. Going forward, though, if we want to look at the next couple of years, what you then need to start worrying about is whether this becomes self-fulfilling um, and expectations. The um, sanguine story focuses on long-run inflation expectations. If you look at the survey of professional forecasters, they've barely raised their inflation forecast, and it's largely consistent with where uh, you'd want to be. Tips, um, similar sanguine forecast. Consumers have gone up a little bit more, but consumers always think there's more inflation than there actually is. The only issue out there was that the long-run consumer expectation was 3% inflation. Um, I wouldn't be worried. Statistically, this is what matters in the 20 years prior to the pandemic. Um, David Reifschneider and David Wilcox, who know more about any of this than uh, any of us on this Zoom or anyone else um, in terms of how these models function, um, take a look at this long run and are not worried about inflation. They think inflation is asymptoting back to two. I am much less learned than them, but I'm also much less sure than them. And it's what in macroeconomics was called the Lucas critique, but basically, I don't think you can do a good job forecasting inflation over the next couple of years using statistical relationships from the 20 years prior to the pandemic. Those statistical relationships were based on a certain um, policy regime, a certain set of expectations around policy, and that's changed dramatically. And so I would move a little bit away from statistical correlations and towards a certain amount of just what theory uh, would tell us what common sense would tell us. Um, business expectations for inflation are sky high and inflationary psychology has really, really taken root in the business community. Uh, this is near short term. Um, consumer expectations are high. Normally these are not good predictors of inflation. At a time like this, I think they'll be uh, likely to be a much better. Not completely sure about it. It's not crazy to say long run ex inflation expectations are anchored. I just think after two or three years of very high inflation, are they still going to be anchored? People act as if um, the relationship between wages and prices is an open question. Um, expectations become instantiated um, in wages, embodied in wages and prices. Um, you can see historically, these are unit labor costs, which just give you the difference between productivity growth and um, uh, the difference between wage growth and productivity growth. So it's basically wage growth or compensation growth adjusted for the additional productivity you have that can generate um, those wage gains. And basically whenever that's high, prices are high. Whenever that's low, prices are low. Yes, these became delinked for about 20 years prior to the pandemic. I think that had much less to do with deunionization and much more to do with inflation becoming um, very predictable and very anchored. Now that inflation is less predictable and unanchored, I expect the relationship between the two of these um, to be closer. And just to put some numbers on it, with wages growing at you know, potentially five, six percent this coming year, productivity, I think, is going to be more like one and a half percent. That gives you something like four percent inflation, give or take. Um, now, Desmond began all of this with sort of the Fed being between sort of a rock and a hard place when it comes to inflation and asset prices. That I'm less worried about. I think it's an open question as to whether the Fed should try to prick a bubble in asset markets when you know, inflation output, those parts of the mandate would tell the Fed not to. Right now though, the Fed's inflation and output mandate is telling it to raise rates. And the fact that that might prick a bubble, I think is more of a plus um, then a minus. 
on top of that. So you don't have the, do you want to go out of your way to prick a bubble? You have, should you not? Um, I think we all know these data, Case Shiller came out this morning, just continued extraordinary growth, 20% faster than the growth we saw in the run-up to the financial crisis. Um, PE ratios are extremely um, high. Um, all of this though is justified. And I think this is the thing that the Fed's gonna need to do the most work on is the expectations for what the Fed's gonna do over the next two years have changed dramatically from basically not raising rates to raising rates pretty sharply. The increase in the 10 year treasury over that same period of time is considerably smaller. Um, why is it considerably smaller? It's because uh, markets appear to think the Fed's gonna stop, that the Fed's not gonna go above two and a half percent. Why do they think that? I don't know. Um, part of it is that the Fed's saying that in its median forecast for its own actions, the dot plot, which I think I like more than Kevin does. I think it's sort of democratizing and lets us all into the meeting um, to see what people are saying and thinking. Um, and real rates, of course, are still extremely low. Um, uh, you know, they've bounced around a little bit, but compared, you know, pre-pandemic to where we've been at any point in the last year, including now. Um, so, you know, where does this leave us? Um, the Fed's, even given its forecast, which I think is too sanguine on inflation, especially for 2023, the Fed is way below a Taylor rule. I tried to take the most dovish rule I could think of. I doubled the weight on the output gap. I took the natural rate of unemployment down to three, five. I took the neutral interest rate down to three and making all of those changes to be as dovish as possible in this rule. Um, I got that the Fed funds rate should only be at six uh, right now instead of the <laughs> roughly eight that the Taylor rule um, would tell you. Um, now, if you're inertial and think you should only change slowly, um, you'd still want to be on course to rising to around 4% um, on the Fed funds rate um, pretty quickly. So I think it's pretty hard to explain um, where interest rates are right now. Um, now, you know, one consideration that I think we were supposed to discuss or one of the ones that was raised was um, the federal budget. The Fed, I don't think will care about the federal budget. The Fed should not care about the federal budget. And I'm actually not that worried about the federal budget. I focus not on debt as a share of the economy, but on the flows. Um, if you look at real interest payments, real interest payments are relatively low in historic perspective. Um, and this, by the way, assumes 3.5% 10 year treasury. So um, this builds in a decent amount of an increase in interest rates. Um, so I don't think the Fed will, I don't think the Fed should care about fiscal dominance. When it comes to bubbles, I think it's an open question as to whether the Fed should care, but at the current moment, its other part of its mandate is screaming so loudly and it goes in the same direction. Um, so would conclude um, what can be done. The Fed should shift to a complete and total focus on fighting inflation. I think they've done that. Um, I think that uh, Chairman Powell after the press conference, in his press conference after the last meeting was very good at the NAB last week, he was even clearer. I think they are done with excuses about inflation. I think they are completely focused on it. And by the way, not focused on forecasts of it. They wanna see inflation come down rather than 2021. You know, we forecast it'll come down so we feel good about ourselves. They're not gonna feel good until it's down. So I feel good about that. Um, raising rates and starting quantitative tightening. Um, they got off to a start. I don't care that the last meeting was 25 basis points. Um, the next two absent a pretty dramatic change in the economy between now and then um, should be 50 basis points. They need to be moving very quickly um, towards where they need to get to. QT needs to be um, substantial. Well, Jason, I think uh, Jason oh. one, you got one minute left. So Great. I, I have one minute of things to share. I think the Fed <laughs> needs to do a much better job of making it clear that the interest rate, uh, the Fed funds rate is going to go well above two and a half percent, go well above three, likely a uh, very good chance it'll go above four. That will help um, with the long end of the curve. And then I think the open question is that they should completely ignore the fiscal implications. They should mostly ignore the financial market implications. And you know, if you see the unemployment rate rising above 4243, I would reopen the conversation about how to set the balance right. Um, but until then, um, they should be 
on um, this type of a course. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Donna. Thank you, Alex. And uh, thank you, Alex and Desmond for inviting me to this, uh, letting me participate at the, at the last minute. So I agree with much of what Kevin and Jason have said. Um, I think, so let me see if I can add just a few things. I do think we're in a very serious situation of high and potentially even rising inflation where uh, or, or at least persistent, very persistent high inflation, much higher than anyone is comfortable with. And uh, to echo what Jason just said, I think the, the labor market is extremely tight. So we've got very strong demand relative to sustainable supply, which is to be sure is being held back a little bit by the, to some extent by the persistent waves of the virus. But the main, the main, point here is the very strong demand, higher than sustainable supply. That's a formula for continued upward pressure on prices. We're seeing it in wages. Like Jason, I follow those unit labor costs, and they are high and probably rising, uh, putting pressure on business costs that will be passed through into prices. And I do worry about expectations. Uh, about unanchoring those longer term expectations as this uh, as this episode uh, continues. Um, I think the Jason's emphasis on kind of the level of demand relative to the level of supply is what we need to concentrate on and then figure out how to realign those and then get inflation down in that situation. How did we get into this mess? Well, I think the First of all, I think we should admit that it's an extraordinary situation to have an economy hit with a virus and shut down. And then analyzing how that recovery is going to happen and what the relative effects of the virus and the policy responses are on supply and demand, we don't have a lot of experience to that to fit into the old models or even any new one that Kevin and his friends at Stanford might be building. Uh, so it was a very, very difficult situation that the Fed was thrown into. The virus has behaved uh, as virus tend to do in a very unpredictable way. We've had additional waves that have had different effects on supply and demand. I do think there was a, a tendency to analyze this uh, as a demand, more on the demand side. So everybody was worried about this is gonna be a repeat of the global financial crisis. We have to hit this with a huge amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus. And they weren't thinking about what would happen as, um, as the virus, the effects of the virus abated and how things would recover um, to do that. But I do think monetary policy has, uh, <laughs> has played a huge, uh, very substantial role, role here keeping rates lower than necessary for longer than necessary. The very large portfolio that they had, they've held on to too long. Um, I think partly this grew out of the, the framework that uh, people have talked about, the ch changes that happened in 2020 that Kevin emphasized grew out of the 20 years that preceded that and the difficulty really for much of that time of getting inflation up to the 2%, 2 target and the uh, experience late in that period, 2017, 2018, 2019 of long-term inflation expectations beginning to drop and worrying in a low or star world about uh, having enough room for monetary policy to stimulate the economy the framework itself so focused on that situation that it didn't really take account of what might happen in another situation. So I think the framework itself was incomplete, only focused on part of the part of the possibility, part of the distribution of possibilities. And it was complicated because of these nonlinearities, because of of, uh, as Kevin noted, we're gonna forecast some kinds of things, inflation will come down, but we won't forecast if inflation is going up. All that was well suited perhaps to the 2010, 2019 period, but was not at all suited to this uh, situation we found ourselves in over the last few years. 
I think another part of the framework was an emphasis on the labor market and the maximum employment part of the Fed's mandate. Uh, and that, had, that grew out of the experience of 2010, 2019, when unemployment rates were able to drop much further than people thought they could. We had very little inflation, uh, inflation, out, uh, inflation outcome from that. So they thought, well, let's emphasize the labor market to go along with inflation, but more emphasis on the labor market. And, and I think part of what happened, so it's the framework emphasized the labor market had the asymmetry of responses, and then it was implemented in a very aggressive way where they said, we are gonna hold rates at zero until both inflation is over two or on its way to being over two, and the labor market is at full employment. So that was not, as Jay Powell said, that's not technically part of the framework, but I think the mindset that put the framework in place, put that forward guidance on interest rates in place. And that was really, uh, really turned out to be um, a dangerous kind of thing to do because they kept saying, well, we've met the inflation part of our forward guidance, but we haven't met the labor market part of our forward guidance. And the other problem with that was the labor market, uh, they said that we're gonna have a broad and inclusive measure of labor market tightness. They never really defined what that was. They got away from full employment is the level, level of employment that keeps inflation low and stable. They got to these other things and they weren't paying attention to that line on Jason's chart that showed the vacancies and the turnover in the labor market. So they are emphasizing the unemployment rate, which took a little time to get down and not the, uh, not the openings. So they, they more emphasis on the labor market, looking at the wrong, uh, what turned out to be the wrong um, metric about labor market tightness they didn't see the tightness, the huge excess demand for labor that's resulted in persistent upward pressure on wages and, will, and on, on prices as well. Um, so I think it's a very, it, 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 um, unfortunately they got themselves, they were slow to recognize the difficulty they had gotten themselves in. So the second issue is how do we get out of this mess? How do we uh, align demand and sustainable supply and do it at a, an inflation rate that's much closer to 2% than it is now? I think one thing we have, we've, the focus of this panel is on the Fed, but we need to say, I think, a need to say a word about fiscal policies and, and other governmental policies. So for sure, we don't need any more fiscal impulse now. We should be paying for whatever programs we're putting in place. And I think in a broader sense, the administration needs to think more clear, clearly about the supply side effects of the things it's doing. And I don't, the, the administration's approach to inflation, I don't think will be, is not gonna really contribute to lower inflation. They talked about competition policy, things like that. There may be reasons to do that, but it's not, to, it's not gonna lower inflation. And I think they need to look, they need to ask themselves every time they're imposing a new rule or thinking about imposing a rule, what is gonna be the effect on the willingness of businesses to supply, supply goods and services and labor uh, and, and people to supply labor. And I don't think that's high on their list. And some things they've talked about bringing uh, by American from unionized uh, labor, I think are going to more, more likely to raise prices than, than lower them. So uh, among the other things I think they ought to think about is lowering those tariffs, increasing immigration, that kind of thing will increase the supply side. That itself won't have a huge increase on a huge effect on inflation, but they should be thinking about the supply side of the economy. On the monetary policy side, um, I agree with the general tenor of what uh, Jason was saying. Um, right now, they've got uh, their raise, they said they're going to raise rates and run down their portfolio, and the increase in rates basically takes them to neutral, uh, assuming our star is somewhere in the neighborhood of zero to 1%. Um, 
that's a necessary first step, but I doubt it'll be sufficient. If you raise, if you if you did know what R star was, the neutral interest rate was, and you raised rates to that point, that ought to bring the economy in at in in at maximum employment, in at full employment at its at its potential. But it doesn't just getting there doesn't certainly doesn't guarantee that inflation will be two percent or moving towards two percent at the time. And there I agree with Jason. I think the 2023 and even more the 2024 inflation projections they have, um, it's not clear how you get there. So you run the unemployment rate below the natural rate for the next couple of years, not a lot, but just a little bit. And somehow inflation is gonna come down I think it does imply that they're counting on a big increase in supply, a big increase in labor force participation to fill those vacancies that are out there, a big uh, loosening up of supply chains, increase in chips and things like that. And I wonder uh, whether they're still betting on the transitory, just stretched out over a longer period of time. So I think if they got uh, interest rates to the neutral rate and put the economy at its potential, that's more likely to happen at inflation rates of three or four percent, maybe even higher, as Jason said, three, four or five, uh, than it is at two or 2.3, which they have for 2024. So I think they're going to, they're going to need to tighten more. They're going to need to get over neutral. They're going to need to slow the economy down and raise the unemployment rate a little bit. That's a very uncomfortable place to be. It's a very uncomfortable policy to engage in. Um, my anecdote is I once put something in a testimony for Alan Greenspan that said there may come a time when inflation is rising and we will need to raise the unemployment rate in order to cool the economy and contain inflation. We got back to the office and he said, Don, that may be right, but I'm never saying that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard uh, policy to implement and do, but I'm afraid that that's what's got to happen. And the commodity price shocks from the, the tra tragedy in Ukraine uh, is just underlining that. So we're already worried before that, uh, before the invasion, before the war started about, uh, about expectations becoming on anchor, getting built into price to price chains to price making. And I think, and I think that's, uh, that those risks are even higher now, given what's happened to petroleum commodity prices. And the final point I want to make uh, just in a minute or two is about the financial markets here. Um, so I, 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 I think it's a little mysterious what's going on out there. They have uh, built in a uh, rise in the federal funds rate to approximately where the Fed says it's going to raise it, give or take a few, a few tenths of... Uh, of, uh, of uh, federal funds rate. And uh, as Jason showed for the long-term inflation expectations embedded in market, the five by fives out in the tips market, that, that's enough to contain those inflation rates out there. Um, at this, so there's been a repricing in markets over this year. Um, I think some of the more recent movements, Kevin, have more to do with what's happening in Ukraine than what's happening to the Fed. So I do think if you date it from the end of the year, or even I haven't looked, but I, I suspect last September when they started to pivot, then you would get a tight, you, you get a net tightening in financial conditions. But it's not huge. It's not big. It looks like a very contained, moderate repricing of assets, risk spreads are a little wider. I think the stock market's down on net. Um, Ten-year treasuries are up a couple points, maybe a point and a half or so. A point, I guess, in two years, maybe a point and a half. Um, the real rates are up maybe half a point, but still negative, as Jason as Jason pointed out. So I think the question, the I mean, one question we should ask ourselves is why are the markets so optimistic about 
the likelihood of a soft landing here, um, I think we, we're skeptical. It's a very odd situation actually, in which the Fed begins on a tightening cycle. The markets build in less than the Fed. The Fed has built in less than the panel of experts here at AEI. Uh, and many economists have built in. Usually markets turn the tightening cycle up much faster. So it's a very different situation than we faced in previous expansions and tightening cycles. And I think- uh, Don, you're, you're into your last uh, minute okay. here. Okay, all right. So I think more repricing will be required. Uh, it'll be required under a situation which cash flows are slowing because growth will need to slow. Uh, so there could be some interesting times in financial markets ahead. And let me just finish with one thought. Jay Powell keeps talking about being humble and nimble. And I think that's also something we need to keep in mind as observers. This is an extraordinary situation with lots of unprecedented things hitting the economy and hitting the financial markets. Um, they have pivoted rapidly, even if late uh, or not rapidly enough. So um, I think a little humility, I certainly feel humble about my, my ability to predict what's going to happen here. And uh, I think the Fed and the observers will have to will have to continue that. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Desmond. Thank you, and uh, thank you to my panel panelists. You're coming last. A lot of what I have to say has already been said, but maybe what I'll do is, you know, before I go into my PowerPoint presentation. Maybe I'll just mention where I disagree with my panelists. Uh, the first point I'd just make is I'm not sure that in 2021, when the Biden administration came up with a $1.9 trillion package on top of $3 trillion that had gone before, when you've had so much in the way of fiscal expansion, you had supply shocks, and then on top of that, you had the loosest monetary policy that you can get. You know, with that combination of loose fiscal policy, loose monetary policy, supply shocks, my only surprise is that inflation is not higher than it is today. So that's the first disagreement I'd have. The second uh, I would say is, I'm not sure that my fellow panelists share the same concern that I do, about what I'd call an everything bubble, which is huge. And I would have thought that our experience in 2008 tells us that if these bubbles are premised on very low interest rates, and then we've got to start raising interest rates in order to deal with inflation, you can get bubbles bursting. When bubbles burst, you go into deep recessions. When you go into deep recessions, inflation becomes the last of your problems. So I just say that by way of introduction. Now, let me get into the PowerPoint, you know, because I just want to illustrate some of these points, you know, with more uh, in the way of slides. So if we could go just to the next slide, uh, what I'm going to just talk about is firstly, you know, what our inflation uh, problem is, uh, that if we go to the next slide, we're talking about inflation, as Jason has mentioned, you know, this chart I just think is impressive. We're seeing consumer prices now around about 8%. We haven't seen anything like that in 40 years. Even core is up to 6.5%. Uh, Going to the next slide, I'm just not as sanguine, I think, as Jason about inflation expectations. If you look at where the five-year break-even inflation rate is now, we're looking at something like 3.6%. We haven't been there for the last 20 years. You know, the Fed's target the next five years, I understood was 2%. You know, I would have thought that this would give them concern. If we go to the next slide, this is just indicating what the OECD thinks is the impact of the Russian invasion. So if you look at the right part, that is the impact on inflation of Russia for the United States is something like if these commodity prices are sustained, 
we're going to add one and a half percent to an inflation rate that's already eight percent. And then you've got all issues of like wages that, uh, shall I say, rents that are lagging. You're going to have pressures, not to mention that you could get pressure coming from China's shut down, you could get that adding to supply shock. So we've got a real inflation problem that is going to require higher interest rates. Now, if we just go to the next slide, uh, we, as I mentioned, what we've got is an everything bubble. And it's not only in the United States, but it's also abroad. So if we go to the next slide, Jason's already put up the slide, but uh, I think it's worth dwelling on it. Uh, just when you've got equity valuations that are double the historic average, you know, you can understand that at an interest rate of zero or 0.5% on the 10 year. But when the 10 year begins going up to two and a half percent as it is right now, these valuations, I'm not sure that they can be sustained for very long, especially if you go into recession. When you get the adjustment, it's going to be a sharp adjustment. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is a chart. Jason's also put it up, but uh, just looking in real terms, we're uh, this is the housing uh, prices in the United States. It's a 100-year chart. But you see that we're back to above 2006, even in inflation adjusted terms. So you've got a housing, you've got an equity bubble, you've got a housing bubble. We go to the next slide. Uh, you've got a credit market bubble on high yield uh, debt. Interest rates are awfully low, you know, and we're now talking about a market that globally uh, the high yield leveraged uh, loans are something like four trillion dollars. You know, so this is more of my concern that you've got a credit market bubble. When that adjusts, we're really going to get stress within the uh, financial system. And if that's not enough, we go to the next slide. Uh, so we've got a um, an emerging market uh, lending in emerging markets has been uh, uh, pretty irresponsible. We've got their debt levels. Uh, we haven't been here before, you know. So I think you've got a perfect storm. As soon as the central banks begin raising interest rates in earnest, we're going to see dislocations in the asset and credit markets, and that is going to lead towards uh, inflation coming down quite abruptly. So I'm not sure that I see how we can get a, uh, a, we can get a soft landing with the asset price and credit market bubble that the Fed together with the Bank of, uh, uh, together with the European Central Bank and the other banks have created. Uh, so that brings me to the next slide, which is, um, the issue of the Fed's poor policy options. You know, as I see it, uh, they've got two policy options. One is just to maintain uh, uh, an expansive monetary policy stance. You know, that monetary policy is, is still uh, pretty expansionary. Uh, that uh, runs the risk of losing control of inflation, adding froth to the markets. And then when eventually you're going to have to act, you have a particularly hard landing the preferable course would be them to have meaningful monetary policy tightening now, you know, burst the bubble now. It's not going to be pleasant, but it's going to be less uh, uh, painful than if we allow things to run and then have to slam the brakes on uh, a little later. So I think that the Fed has really got itself into a huge mess. And I think that that was unavoidable, if that was avoidable, you know, had in 2021, you know, I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, Kevin that they've been far too data dependent, not looking forward. It was really just amazing to me that you have a $1.9 trillion budget approved and the Fed still sticks to the same uh, policy, you know, as if nothing's uh, happened. Uh, so, if we go to the next slide, we can talk about monetary policy mistakes. Plenty of those have been mentioned. Uh, it just strikes me that every policy mistake has been made in the book. You know, that whether it's, you know, you forgot about, as Kevin mentioned, you've got about Friedman's uh, inflation's a monetary phenomenon everywhere and at all times. Uh, 
uh, that you also forgot that monetary policy operates with long and variable lags. Uh, but we go to the next slide. I would say that one of the uh, big problems that they make is ignoring uh, the dangers of the uh, asset price bubbles. You know, I'm just not sure what was learned from 2008. Uh, you know, we're repeating the same thing. And, you know, as I mentioned in my introductory marks, this chart, uh, I find it rather impressive. You know, you just see what the Powell Fed has done, uh, which is the red line. Uh, in the space of uh, something like uh, 10 months, uh, they managed to bloat the Federal uh, Reserve's balance sheet by $4 trillion. Uh, that, and then you, know, you get surprised that you've got bubbles uh, everywhere uh, you know, on a very much more pervasive uh, scale than you had in uh, 2006. If we just go to the next slide, this is the point that I was making uh, before, you know, that monetary policy really didn't react. You had uh, fiscal policy expansion. You know, we're talking about uh, something like 25% increase, 25% of GDP increase in fiscal expansion in a two year period. You know, and the Fed uh, doesn't uh, raise interest rates in anticipation that that might cause inflation. You know, I just find that hugely irresponsible. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a point that uh, uh, Kevin uh, mentioned. You know, you don't have to be a monetarist. Uh, to look at a chart like this and know that there's something is going to go wrong. Uh, what we're seeing here is the U.S. broad money supply increase. You know, we had in uh, 2021 something like a 25% increase in broad money. We hadn't seen anything like this in 50 years. You know, I'm not sure why one is surprised that you're getting inflation uh, right now. Uh, if we go to the next slide... Uh, you know, this is a point uh, that um, uh, Jason made. You know, you look at the Taylor rule, they seem to have uh, ignored uh, the Taylor rule as well. Uh, you know, just allowed interest rates to uh, get too low. So you know, I, I would just say that uh, they've made huge policy mistakes, you know, and hopefully, you know, when uh, this all comes to an end, uh, you know, that we just don't have another... A repeat of you know what we should have learned about in 2008. Uh, I'll leave it there, Alex, and turn it back to you. Hey, thank you, Desmond. I think I'd like to start just uh, with a key point that Desmond brings up here, and then ask each of the other members of the panel, Kevin, Jason, and Don, what you think about this. Everybody has said it's time for a serious uh, bring inflation down set of steps. That would be interest rates, maybe quantitative tightening, Jason said, and so on. Do you agree uh, with Desmond that if those serious anti-inflationary or controlling the current excess and in threatening inflation steps were taken, that the result would be a serious deflation of asset prices uh, and, uh, and falling uh, let's say a imploded, a potentially imploding asset bubbles. So, what if you address the inflation? Then, does a does a serious asset price decline take place? Kevin, uh, is that is that to me first, Alex? Well, you you were first, so I thought I'm just going okay. in order of the panel. Sure. So, so in answer to that, if I had believed we were in a durable equilibrium in asset prices then doing the right and responsible thing in monetary policy wouldn't have to lead to that outcome. But I share a lot of the sentiments that were described by Desmond just a few moments ago, which is asset prices have been, I'd say, unmoored from economic fundamentals because of the long conduct of monetary policy that frankly preceded uh, COVID and the response thereto. So I think that asset prices do not find themselves in a way such that we could rely on them if there was a material change, a material regime change in the conduct of monetary policy. So that's point one. Point two, um, in response to that, we've given relatively short shrift in the limited time to the balance sheet growth and quantitative easing and tightening. As a, as a first approximation, but an imperfect one, uh, 
In my view, interest rates have a bigger effect on the real economy and the balance sheet maneuverings have a bigger effect on financial markets, on financial assets. Um, even as the Fed adjusted its policy quite re re remarkably from December till more recent, as we all know, they were buying mortgages until about a week ago. So, so I think in some ways, the explanation for the riddle that Don posed about why financial markets really don't seem to be sort of getting the story here, if I were to reduce it to anything else, it's because quantitative easing has been alive and well, and markets aren't sure about the direction of it. Moreover, I'll just make one final point in the interest of time. Um, retail investors are the ones that have jumped into this thing over the last couple of weeks after a bit of a surprise. Um, markets are more segmented, fixed income markets versus equity markets, in part because of this radical use of quantitative easing uh, in the last uh, quantitative easing 20 or whatever we're up to. And retail investors have learned, I'd say for good reason, to buy the dips. So they're back in this thing. But I do think a simple answer to your, to your question is, uh, the asset market, the level of asset markets, the durability of these asset markets will only add to the challenge the Fed has to achieve a soft landing. So much so that while I agree with Jason that inflation is more likely to miss to the upside relative to even these new forecasts from the Fed, if they play this thing such that the landing is hard, I'm much more convinced that they'll avoid price stability, whether it be in one direction or the other. Hey, thank you. Jason, I think you said in your remarks that in order to get control of the inflation, you'd accept a, a bursting of the bubble or bursting of a bubble. But uh, do you want to add anything else on this on this uh, hypothesis of Desmond? If we get the, the uh, strong anti-inflation action, then we get a collapse of asset prices or at least a serious asset price problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing that Desmond said that I'm most sure of is if it's a bubble, then waiting just means it'll get worse and be even bigger when it eventually happens. Yeah. There is room between where interest rates are now and say a 10 year treasury at you know, three and a half percent um, to, that's, cons you know, that's consistent with the asset prices we see not being completely crazy. So it's not like there's, you know, with, with rates this low, the asset prices make sense. I don't think rates will stay this low. Um, there's some room for them to rise. I think there are financial risks. I just think the Fed um, you know, can't take those that seriously. They can't be um, in the business of trying to stabilize the stock market. They should be in the business of trying to stabilize prices. Thank you. Don, you have anything to add on this point? Well, I do think- uh, Having been few, a few, through a few of these battles before, <laughs> I have. Um, so I, I think asset, asset markets are were priced uh, to low rates for a very long time, and uh, part and and that that reflected very low inflation for a long time, and it reflected low equilibrium real rates or low real rates consistent with holding the economy at full employment. Uh, so it wasn't crazy. All right. And uh, I think, that, and they've begun to adjust to higher rates. There will be, as I tried to say, I think there'll be more adjustment in the future. Whether this kind of cracks the market and uh, has, uh, has major effects on financial stability, I, I, I'm not convinced that it, it necessarily does. So as J Jason put out a three and a half percent 10 year rate, that's a percentage point, I think approximately above where it is now. It's already written, risen two percentage points in the last six months and no market has cracked. So uh, I think the financial stability, first of all, the banking system is a heck of a lot safer than it was in 2008. And that's, that's very helpful. I think there are questions about non-bank finance, questions that governments here and abroad are, are talking about how to, how to bolster the non-bank bank finance st stability right now. But uh, I don't, uh, there's always a risk that something cracks. But, but I would also say to, uh, and Jason made a good point, I think the last point on his chart was the Fed shouldn't be over sensitive to this. And I think back to 94, all right, 
And we raised rates quite a bit quickly and pieces of the market cracked. I mean, there were mortgage, Alex, you remember I this. I remember it well. <laughs> you were in Chicago, I think, where pieces of the mortgage market were breaking around you. Yes, that's um, true. <laughs> and uh, firms were going out of business. Mexico got in trouble. Uh, there was a lot of damage from that, but the Greenspan-led Fed kept tightening, at least into early early '95. So I think the the markets may be more resilient than Desmond thinks they are. Um, maybe that's wishful thinking, Desmond. I don't know. Speaking of how far rates went up, I I want to just repeat that we're at a two and a half percent or so ten-year uh, note. That's still a very low rate. Exactly, Especially because they, relative to where inflation is, as everybody has said. So. Right, right. But it's expecting inflation to come down, and I think some expectation of inflation will decline is perfectly, right. perfectly reasonable. It's just it's not going to decline. I think to where the Fed thinks it's going to decline. Yeah. Thank you. I, we have a question from the audience, and we're we're down. We got about ten minutes left, but I want to make sure we get this in because we haven't talked very much about housing. And we have talked about the huge uh, Fed portfolio of long-term fixed rate mortgages. Uh, and, uh, and we've talked about the house prices being over where they were at the peak of the, of the infamous uh, housing bubble uh, of 1999 to 2006 or so. But how about uh, house prices now? One of our participants asked, didn't, didn't the Fed uh, help create the house price inflation, maybe bubble, uh, by its uh, suppression of uh, long-term rates and of mortgage rates in particular? Now we got mortgage rates have moved from around 3% on the 30-year uh, mortgage to pushing 45 to 5%. That's, that's a big lot of difference in cash flow to the household. And maybe they'll go higher. Five percent is a fairly low mortgage rate, at least viewed over the last forty or fifty years. Um, what about what about housing? Anybody want to comment on that? Floor is open. I think they continued to buy these mortgage-backed securities longer than they should have. It was they emphasized that they thought their purchase mortgage-backed securities wasn't aimed so much at the mortgage market as at long-term rates entirely, but they had an opportunity to make a statement, which was, we see this, we don't, we actually don't think what we're doing is making a huge contribution here, but we can make at least a symbolic or maybe a material contribution towards reining that in. Just shifting those purchases over to treasuries would have been at least a, a nice a nice way of, of meeting that. So I do think they contributed to some extent. I also think there's been a shift in underlying demand. There was a lag in household formation after the global financial crisis. And maybe the kids were staying home instead of moving out. Having been stuck with their parents through 2020, they're now decided it's more fun if you move out. So I think the demand, there is a genuine increase in the demand for housing and in particular uh, out in certain areas, both in the city and outside in the suburbs. But uh, the Fed, the keeping those rates as low as they were for as long as certainly has contributed. So it will be interesting to see now that, as you say, Alex, rates have adjusted, whether that takes any of the steam out of the housing, out of the housing yeah. market. Thanks, Tim. Other I think, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would just want to add that, to me, that seems to be the basic problem, is that what the Fed has done is it seems to totally ignore asset price inflation. You know, so they've got us into a situation now where it's very difficult to get the soft landing. The mistake that they made was to totally ignore housing prices, equity prices, credit markets, emerging markets, the whole ball of wax. I don't hear them ever talking about housing prices increasing by 20%, and that's a problem. You know, that's something that's unsustainable and that'll come to a bad end. So I'm not suggesting 
that at this stage of the game, the Fed has dealt themselves such a poor hand, they have to raise interest rates to deal with inflation and they have to take their lumps on the bubbles, but they should not have been in this kind of position, you know, where they created bubbles of the sort. And just one final point, it's not just that these bubbles are premised on very low interest rates, they're also premised on the economy humming along at a pretty good rate. So if you've got the combination of high interest rates and slow growth, uh, you've got a problem in terms of all of these valuations. And I wouldn't be too sure about the non-banks. You know, I was around at Solomon when LTCM went belly up. You know, we'll have a few of these LTCMs. Uh, I, I don't see how you can't won't get this with all of the debt that we've created. Good point, Desmond. Thank you. All right, we're down to our last five minutes. I'd like to go through the panel and give everybody a chance to make any uh, final summing up comments that you'd want to make. Uh, we only have about one and a half minutes each, so, uh, and we'll just go in the same order. Kevin, final shot. Sure. Thanks, Alex. So what I heard over the last hour or so is an incredible consensus among people that have quite different uh, stripes on their feathers. And uh, for the Federal Reserve, if they've lost Don Cohn, they've got themselves a very, very big problem. <laughs> so I'll end with my best policy recommendation. I think there's a spare job or two, even including one that might be Vice Chairman DK. And I think the best that they could do is get Don to suit up, sign up for one more game. Tom Brady retired for a short while too, and look, he's back. And they, they need someone who is unafraid, who both knows the institution, but is unafraid to sort of call them to task. Their job's not getting any easier. So I hope that Don uh, receives the president's call uh, quite favorably later today. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jason, a minute and a half, final shot. Yeah, I think we could make the Don Cone thing a consensus on this panel. Um, <laughs> although if Don had any say in it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we could get to consensus. Um, I agree with Kevin on a lot of agreement on this panel. People coming from different perspectives. Um, the one thing I sort of regret underemphasizing in my comments, Don had it a bit in his, is just the amount of uncertainty here. Um, this all seems quite obvious right now. This worm could turn eight different ways. Uncertainty should not be an argument for inaction. To some degree, it's almost an argument for doing more. Let's wait to see the inflation actually come down because we're uncertain. Let's not hold off because we think unemployment will go up. Wait for it to go up a decent amount before we even consider um, holding off. So uncertainty doesn't just mean do less. Sometimes it means um, persevere, but definitely uh, need to be prepared to um, change the game plan, but really based on actual data more than projections of data going forward. Thank you, Don. So just, uh, we, do not, we do not have a consensus on this panel that Don <laughs> comes to go back to the Federal Reserve Board, just to make that clear. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I, I just echo what Jason said. I do think that the uncertainty is huge. It's, it's been a very difficult, situation to deal with for the central bank, even if we think they're late in recognizing the issues and got themselves in the wrong mindset there. I do think they need to be flexible going forward. So one uh, nimble and humble going forward. And one concern I might have is suppose we're wrong. And they start at, at which I know is hard to imagine but it could be true and the market is right. And they raise rates to about two, two and a half percent. The economy slows, inflation comes down. I think one risk is they get themselves in the other mindset that, oh my God, we're behind the curve. We've got to get going here. So I think they're going to, they need to be open to the possibility that Warsh and Cohn and Furman and, uh, Lockman are, are uh, wrong and back off. I thought uh, so. That's going to be very. That's going to be very hard. I don't think that's that's not my modal or modal anticipation, Kevin. But I think it's it's a tail risk, and so I think reacting to the incoming data, being flexible, recognizing the unusual situation is going to be very important. Thank you, Desmond. 
Thank you for arranging this extraordinarily interesting and, and high class panel. And you, as arranger, get the last word. So, what, what would your concluding comments be? I guess my concluding comments would be the same as the joke about the person who asked a local for directions to get to a certain place. And the reply was uh, he would have started from a different place. You know, and I think the same is my advice to the Fed is that they should have started from a different place uh, that they've really got themselves into a pickle. You should not have come here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? Anything else, Desmond? No, I, I, I think I've made it uh, clear what my view is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all to a great panel uh, with excellent uh, comments. And uh, thanks to all the participants who've been with us on the video. And we are adjourned.